good e uh, good afternoon. Let's see if I can get heard. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, always account for there could be technical difficulties. If someone's dropping the chat, they can hear me. I don't trust technology. Anyway, it's a um, rainy afternoon here in Los Angeles. And I'd like to remind everyone who is joining uh, that if you you want to, if you're viewing this through Patreon, which I know you are, because that's the only way to get to the link for this, um, you need to uh, click on, click on like the actual link at the top when you go like hover over, you know, the picture of this live chat and click on that and then open it up in YouTube. Because I'm using StreamYard, which is a software that allows me to pull your comments and put them on the screen to interact better, that I'd, you have to be like looking through the YouTube screen, not just on the Patreon, um, Patreon view. Because otherwise, StreamYard doesn't connect to Patreon, it only connects to YouTube. That is, if you want to um, put your um, comments up on the screen. So anyway, I am going to be talking about what the over body podcast got wrong and it really i'm going to talk about some other things but the main premise you know my commentary today is essentially this i want to show to you that it potentially is possible that the people have it sounds a little much like that let me try this let me know if this is better I had a little setup. I have like, and I don't know if it works. Can you hear me now? I think it's good to hear me. Anyway, keep telling me if you can't hear it, then I'm gonna keep going. But essentially, um, here's my premise of what this whole presentation, what you know, what I want to lay out for today. Is my, I I think there's a good possibility that the people, the main storytellers who have told this story so far in the media with a great attention, and I'm talking about the Over My Dead Body podcast, really hearing me. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll pull my microphone then. Yep. Can you hear me now? Hopefully this is better. I'm not, I just disconnected my microphone. Whenever you introduce new things into the variable, sucks it should be working now hello okay so much better great yeah i think it's because i have this microphone um i don't know if it's breaking i don't know if it's no good but we'll just go right through my computer now see i was trying to get fancy and i totally screwed myself um all right. Okay. So starting over, I'll edit this if I ever repost it again. Okay. So here's the premise of what I want to talk about today. I think there is a possibility that the people that have been most prominent storytellers of pushing the story out to the media potentially miss the huge point of this, or maybe don't see through it through some sort of bias. They could say, I'm biased. And I maybe, you know, we all have our bias. Yes, of course I'm biased. Um, you know, I'm just, you know, your average woman um, that, you know, has lived a life and I'm, I'm using my insights and my personal experience to try to figure this out just as they are, just as these storytellers are. But there's three in particular 
um, that I'm going to hit on today. So it's, you know, talk about the people that did the over my dead body podcast. So tally, so that's Matt Shear and his producers. Um, and then I'm going to talk about Stephen Epstein and yes, I will keep it civil. Um, I really do want to make some, um, some fair points and, um, address my own biases. And then three is I want to talk about, um, uh, David Lapp. Um, so those, you know, David Lapp was, you know, I was reading all of this stuff that he did, you know, with great uh, fever, um, you know, really do appreciate his reporting. So this is not a knock on him, but he was, you know, someone who came out and sort of laid out his thinking of why he thought Wendy was not involved. I think the Over My Dead Body pod podcast, which was very well done. This is not like a critique. I think it's a good thing. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, I like I, I like the podcast. But, um, you know, I think it gets the big thing wrong. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, Stephen Epstein is, you know, came out and said that he was only, you know, focusing on, um, you know, that he didn't think Wendy was involved either. So I just want to walk through what I can see as potential pattern between all of those things. So basically, David Latt, who was the first reporter on it, sort of pushing out you know, what was going on, thankfully, because, you know, it was a great way to digest good information. He did do that. But I want to address how he did that. And I want to address the pattern of how that bled into Over My Dead Body a podcast, which I also loved. And then I want to talk about how that bled into the first person to write a book about this, um, Stephen Epstein. And I want to show you a pattern and I want to take you down a path. So let's go. Okay, so let's see. People are saying hi. Hello. Hello, Scythe. Hello, Liz, resume writer. Jen Henry. Kitty Cool Lady. Estranged One. Earth to Earth. Angela. Okay. So let me go through and then we can stop and I'll, I'll, I'll address your, you know, things. I'll kind of go point by point when it's a good time to address questions. Well, we'll do it that way ongoing. Okay. Now I saw this a long time ago. This is a tweet from a guy um, named Chris Evans and it's a thread and he clearly read the over my dead body pod podcast and um, or listened to it and thought about it. And it touched him, obviously, if he took the time to write this as much as it touched all of us. So he cares. He cared enough to do this and lay this out. Um, but I think he touches on a really important point. I think, I think I, you know, let's read it together and we'll talk about it on the back end. But he did a Twitter thread. He has over 100,000 followers. You know, he's, you know, he's got some sort of a, a presence. But he, he writes this. I listened to the Over My Dead Body podcast when it came out and then recently watched multiple specials about the murder Adelson family afterwards. And the disparity was shocking. In the podcast, their portrayal of Wendy Adelson, Adelson is neutral at worst, sympathetic at best. Okay, go on. So he's like us. He, he not only listened to the podcast, he went and watched the, like the datelines like us, he absorbs what was out there. He writes, continues to write, I don't know how to explain it, other than the producers must have a connection to Wendy or that they are duped by white women tears. I listened to her interrogation and her testimony across multiple trials, and she is one of the most calculating, cunning people I've ever encountered. The Adelson family, dentists, I think, all seemed like a, a gaggle of sociopaths, quite frankly. This is a murder that was commissioned because Wendy her, and her husband were getting divorced. And Dan asked the court to stop letting the Adelson grandmother badmouth him to the kids. That literally was what prompted a murder for hire plot. She wrote a book in which she admitted um, was in part autobiographical that implied she was not only wanted out of the marriage, but wanted her husband out of her children's lives.
After her husband was murdered, she not only changed her children's last names, she even legally changed one of her son's middle name because it referenced his paternal grandmother. He's wrong about this Fort Lauderdale. It's Miami, but similar, I mean, area. Wendy wanted to move to Fort Lauderdale, but Dan Markell lived in Tallahassee and she wasn't allowed because they had joint custody. Her mother sent her a torrent of unhinged emails. There's been a lot of speculation. Okay. So just sort of going back to that, um, I just think that he's right. <laughs> I mean, I love the podcast. Don't get me wrong. I devoured it more than once. Um, but he's right. You know, um, they really handled her. I don't know. Not to get into that. I want to play some video. And w what's next? And the video is. Um, the video is about it's something it was it was episode seven. So it was, I think it was one they did after around the trial or it was sort of a looking back to um, what, you know, reflecting on the, the podcast success and popularity, um, as well as, you know, what it was like to go through it. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that this, I just actually spent five minutes trying to figure out when this episode seven aired, but I, I know that they did do um, one after the first trial or yeah, after the first trial in October, 2019. Um, and I know that over my dead body actually, so over my, uh, the arrests were in 2016. So, um, so it was like the second half with, you know, Mag Banawa and Zufredo and Lewis. It's the second half of 2016. And this podcast over my dead body came out in January, 2019. And then the first trial, um, you know, with Zufredo and Mag Banawa was October 19th. So I think that this was somewhere after that. And, you know, they obviously had a juror interview as well. Um, but just listen to how they talk about, um, well, we'll talk about in the back end. You can hear it for yourself. For Wendy knew what she knew. Oh, no. A lot of speculation, even in your show, about whether Wendy knew what she knew, when she knew, what she knows now. What, personally, with your very limited contact with her, what do you think? I don't know. I go back and forth. It's something I think about, I've thought about since the beginning, right? I mean, I, I think that we had this conversation with um, Georgia Kappelman, who's the prosecutor on the case, and we brought up, uh, you know, the, the Wendy's reaction to Dan's death in the, in the interrogation room. And obviously extremely forceful, right? Uh, really sobbing. So we said... I remember this conversation very vividly with Georgia and we said, what did you, what did you think? Did, how could somebody have a reaction like this if they weren't learning about the murder for the first time? And Georgia's reaction was, yes, I understand what you're saying, but there are some people in law enforcement who think the opposite, that it was intentionally, that it was a forced performance and that it was the performance of someone who was acting. Mm -hmm. I tend to think personally that that kind of her reaction could not have not been genuine in some way. I mean, I okay, I'm just to stop it there and make a comment. Um, I can give people a pass on watching that the first time or even two times and um, kind of be fooled because, you know, Wendy is very smart, very calculated. We've seen what she can do on the stand under pressure, how quick she is on her, th her feet. I mean, her whole life has been, you know, I think, you know, valedictorian, pleasing Donna, um, little Miss Perfect. This is just my views, my commentary. Um, and also just growing up with girls like this, you know what I mean? Like I've known people like her and I've seen so many, you know, it gives me unique insight as a, as a woman and, you know, I have to throw gender at it or to be woke. Cause I, you know, I don't want to even go into the political nature, but I'm not really that, you know, but I, you know, there's just women's intuitions, a thing, and you obviously know your own gender and can read the tells faster. And, you know, it's just experience. It's just how you have gone about your life. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I've been friends who have watched connive men and their parents all my life. And I just, it's, it's something that is known to me and I've experienced with um, more so than others, 
maybe of men. Um, so anyway, that hang out with men. Uh, so I think that um, I would give someone a pass on the first or second time. However, if you're going to go out and you are going to um, get 10 million, you know, views uh, on this story, if you are going to sell the rights of this to be made into a TV show, therefore compounding your storytelling, right? Because this is a story, but it's an ongoing investigation. So you have a responsibility to um, to do this as well as you can and not inject your biases, right? Because you don't know what's going to come keep coming out. If you're going to be thinking about how long this these tra trials have been delayed, think stuff comes out. That's the risk of delaying, continuing, or, or writing a book or a podcast during an open investigation instead of doing a look back is that you don't know what else can come out. Just like the Dulce Vita tape being re-clarified, if he hadn't delayed so long, that probably wouldn't have gotten into evidence, right? Um, but because of, you know, new people come forward, that's the risk that you take on. And much so when you're putting out a body of work. Um, so Matt Sheard really thinks that Wendy, that hyperventilating, you know, covering her face, all, you know, going through all of the tissues, the mercy hands, who would do this? Her reaction to the punishment question, the way that she sobbed and goes directly into like specific detail. Um, he thinks that that's really, there's a lot genuine in there. Right? So, I mean, that's his right. That's his take. Um, but it's a dictating narrative that this podcast had. Um, and just like Stephen Epstein's book is a dictating narrative as it's being written in the middle of an active investigation. We'll get that later. And just like David Latt, who's a former prosecutor who blogged on this stuff before anyone else, which I'm grateful he did, but he set the narrative by giving his opinion. And, you know, we'll get into that a little later. And that's just my point. And I'll show you the pattern. So let's finish this up. Look, I, uh, who knows? I've never met Wendy. I've never spoken to her directly, but it's a visceral, really wrenching reaction to the news. You know, what she said to me was, what, what was your impression of her? I really enjoyed speaking okay. to her. So that, that was it. So I just want to, there it is, Matt Shear saying it's visceral. I believe it. It's genuine. So therefore, Wendy may not have, you know, been involved. And it goes back to Chris Evans' tweet of like, I don't, these producers were duped. <laughs> By her so now this is the after action you know part as well just to remind you and so this is a producer um that it reminds me it was funny because it was in terms of noticing patterns if you see um steve epstein on judy's channel and then also on um you know surviving the survivor and then even like i haven't listened to the podcast but on david lack's podcast so all three places he goes he tells the story about how he interacts with wendy over um email so these guys are also really really excited at the prospect of talking to this central character woman um who is sort of like the you know they say that we're obsessed with her obsessed of like you know the speculation of you know accusing her of being guilty before she's, you know, ever been to court and being like obsessed with punishing her without looking at the objective facts. They seem awful. They seem awfully um, obsessed with the prospect of, of getting to interview her. Um, and I'm not saying that they want to sleep with her um, or get in her pants or anything like that. I'm not saying it's that direct. I'm saying she's the femme fatale of the story. She's the queen bee. Um, they all admit that she's like the big question. Did she know or did she not know? And I just think that they're hungry to, you know, have that back and forth. And, you know, maybe it does or maybe it doesn't color their perception of how they're viewing this case holistically. Because if they, if Matt Shear and these producers are, do, are doing this after the first trial, which I think they are because they went down, um, Anyway, you know, they had all the discovery. They had all the wiretap calls. They got to read the affidavits. But after that first trial, when you learned about the police tape, about her going up, driving to Tres Trescott, and that, that actually, I believe, was in the police file, Craig Isom's initial police report. So they should have, they sh if they were doing that podcast and ripping through everything, they should have noticed that. And then, so, and so they heard, you know, they know about driving up to the police tape, all the things that I've, like, outlined, um, the, the Boulier bourbon, um, you know, the TV repair and this is so sweet. Um, you know, they there there was some stuff that really, you know, they should address, right? Um, but instead they're taking the opportunity to talk about 
how exciting it is at the prospect of actually interviewing and that what you know it's like and you notice it with epstein and i'm not saying it's right but they both do it right so let's listen. like everybody said she was very charming um the funny thing was and i said thank you for ex accepting my friend request um, and she said, well, I actually have, so my name is Marshall Louie. She said, I actually have a cousin with a very similar name. So I thought you were my cousin oh, when you friend requested wow. me. And so that's why I accepted your request. Oh, wow. Ooh, ooh. Which but I thought was funny. But what do you think makes sense about her accepting the interview? Because, I mean, what does she have to gain, I guess, at this point of doing interviews? It was, well, no, it was, a, it was a preliminary conversation, but it was not off the record. So it was a preliminary conversation that we had. We got into it in detail, and then it was a conversation about whether she was going to sit for a recorded interview. And that did not happen. And that did not happen. We had a, we would have had a million things to ask her. Okay, so first of all, um, Wendy is a lawyer, and Wendy has game strategized this with Laura, no doubt. You know, her image is important to her. So it's... To think that she would have this preliminary phone call and it would still be an open-ended question whether she would give an interview is, you know, it's it's hard for me to buy that because I think she knows that that's not good for her. And I think that she what she does is she has these contacts, much like we'll get into with you know Stephen Epstein of her sort of flirting, you know, central character email. She does is she hooks them in and you know, whether she's being nice like she as is to have this preliminary phone conversation. Or the, the going back and forth, it is sort of a way to get in the head and, and potentially make people think that they have, you know, a chance, a chance, right? So they might still, they, it, would, it would behoove them to continue to be nice to her publicly um, if they're going to get a chance to, to, you know, to possibly speak with her, be nice you know, to her. So anyway, because she's a big get if you're doing anything related to this murder, right? I don't know. It just factors in. I think it does. So here, here they go. Talk more about it. You know, we, we could have kept her on the phone for five hours asking questions. And, you know, I think the, the immediate short term thought is, you know, what can we get her to cooperate at all? Does she want to tell any of her story or not? And then you start thinking about what you would ask her. So I think we were in sort of this limbo where Marsha was talking to her a little bit and communicating and we we're thinking, well, maybe this might actually be possible and that you know, I think we would have moved on to the next phase where we would have prepared actual questions. But, you know, the, the lawyer pretty quickly put the kibosh on that. Um, yeah, sure. But, you know, I, I, like she didn't talk I have, we have a list of people that someday we hope we will be able to speak to. Wendy is obviously at the top of that list. And I hope she does tell her story. I actually get the feeling that she probably will. I think what you can get out of the writing workshop that she did and comments that she's made since that she does feel like she's been and comments that she made to Marsha that she does feel like she's been maligned that her side of the story hasn't been told and that she does want to get it out there in a way that she can control it because you know she hasn't been able to control any of her own story in any real way it's it's been very much driven by law enforcement and prosecutors so yeah I mean look I, I hope someday we do get to that point and we might you know, we might eventually get there. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. There's been a Okay, I mean, they want to talk to her. I get it. I get it. I mean, I just read that Chris Evans tweet. And I just think there's a real, I mean, that's a real viewpoint. I mean, again, this is going to be a TV show based on his this podcast. The podcast was widely successful. And, it, you know, the person um, at the time they made it, and I guess maybe after the you know first trial, I don't even know. They they tend to still um, they may still believe that they believe that they may still think that that is a genuine reaction that Wendy is giving um, in the police interview. And it is a matter of opinion, but you know these are these um, these are the the people that kind of went out first as the storytellers of this ongoing you know murder conspiracy so anyway it wouldn't surprise you to know that given matt Shear's thoughts um on wendy and um you know that he would write this review about stephen epstein's book who also does not believe that wendy's involved so he writes hey judy so it's i'm gonna actually have, i'm gonna give you a shout out in a second and it's a very good one but anyway he writes on stephen epstein's book that it's empathetic, engrossing, and impeccably researched. Extreme punishment is the single best piece of reporting I've read on the Dan Markell case. 
Unlike the best, unlike the best true crime books, it says much about law and society as it does about Dan's murder and subsequent trials. A genuine revelation. So he's the creator and host of you know over my dead body. So again, nothing bad to say, but you know again, it's someone who else held a very sympathetic view, storyteller podcast, and now we're having them linked up with the first person to write a book about this active investigation, who also has expressed. Um, that they also do not believe that Wendy knew or had beforehand knowledge. So it's just, again, these are the people that have been controlling the narrative. And you can kind of see how they're aligned. These I do, are first of all, Judy, I want to apologize to you and say that you are a complete pro. Um, you know, for reading this, I know I was going buck wild in the comments. I'm just so passionate about this. And I was just so upset. It was a human reaction. Um, you know, is, you know, I was so upset when he was just blurting all this out and saying that he was going to be telling this story. He was a storyteller, but wasn't going to look at behavior, only facts. I just don't think you can tell a story if you don't look at behavior. And of course, I was upset by all the snarkiness about um, Jeff Lacoste and him potentially not sit watching Jeff's interview or incorporating all the stuff that, you know, we've talked about, which is circumstantial evidence that does point to Wendy. So anyway, it was just, it was like watching someone, you know, like you're on the playground and you see like maybe a little girl building like a castle or something, or like on, you know, on the beach, you build, you know, a sand castle, or you see, you know, you build all these like Legos and you build this immaculate, you know, toy as a kid or, you know, or, or cards. And then just to watch a boy come running and kind of whoop, you know, smash it all down. I know that's kind of silly, but that's kind of what it felt like. So I apologize for totally going crazy. It wasn't just me, but I participated because um, you had to conduct this interview like a pro. So my apologies. You did great. Thanks for putting up with me and still being a um, friend. So anyway, I just want to play a little bit about this. Questions. Was Wendy Adelson involved? Was Harvey who will be charged? or arrested next? And what do you think about Wendy's police interview? Okay, so obviously the whole Wendy issue is one that people have obsessed over since the day Dan Markell was gunned down in his garage. Um, and you know, I've watched the interview multiple times, five hours thereabouts with uh, Craig Isom at the Tallahassee Police Department. My impressions are those of a lawyer. And as a lawyer, I'm not trying to read whether somebody is telling the truth, overacting, uh, being too emotional, um, faking out the investigator. I look at objective facts to try and inform my decisions. It's how I practiced uh, law for 32 years. And that's how I look at uh, the true crimes that I write about. And so I have a list of objective facts I'm gonna share with your audience. and it'll kind of tip my hand as to what I think about um, whether Wendy herself was involved. We'll talk about the others in a minute, but this is, Wendy is everybody's obsession, right? So. Okay. So yeah, I mean, essentially, I'm not going to go into further any of those facts, but again, first person to write a book and an active ongoing invest investigation where things are still able to unfold. Um, but it's like, you're also, yeah, you're a lawyer, but you're a storyteller. And behavior and telling a true crime story and to say that you won't look at the behavior or factor it in. I mean, I mean, you're a lawyer, then you know about consciousness of guilt. That's behavior. <laughs> and that is used by prosecutors all the time. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? So anyway, again, we're going to feed in even more. You notice that all these players are connected. The first blogger, the first podcast and the first person to write a book. They all support each other. Um, so this is from, you know, David Latt, you know, Jeff, Stephen Epstein, they had him on. David Latt was supposed to write the book. I don't, I don't, you know, Stephen Epstein says because David Latt decided that true crime wasn't for him and he sort of backed out of the genre, but he has him on here. And um, he talks about, you know, if you look here, He's doing an interview, inviting Stephen Epstein. He says this email, his email corresponds with Dan's ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, um, who some suspect playing a role in the murder. You know what I mean? Still, it's even in like, you know, it's co-conspirator. George just said it in open court. 
So, I mean, still these guys don't, you know, so I don't know. It's, um, and again, they love to talk about how they almost snagged Wendy. It's like a sound bite for them when they all go talk on each other's. And we just heard it from, you know, the producer of Over My Dead Body. So, I don't know, patterns, connections. And David Latt, again, so I told her I was going to talk about three things. Um, I was going to talk about um, the first podcast, which was, you know sold its rights with a 2020 based on it, it's report real reporting, and then it's going to be a you know I think a TV series I believe or a documentary I'm not sure. And the second one was the first book that's being written about this murder. Um, it's still an ongoing investigation, and now here was the first blogger who and all of the you know with the exception of Stephen Epstein. I mean I was you know. I love the podcast. I've listened to it many times. And, you know, I was reading David uh, Latt's stuff and absorbing it as a consumer. So I just want to put that out there. It's not like a, you know, critique on them. Very, they fulfilled a need. But um, if you just look here, I mean, look at all the headlines he put out, you know, where his lawyer, you know, Wendy's lawyer got all these articles about, you know, that he wrote about how they were going to sue people or talking bad about her. Um, and then about how, um, you know, a billionaire speaks out in defense of Wendy Adelson. Adelson again, you know, just the headline. Um, Dan Markell case. Wendy um, Adelson's lawyer calls out her accuser, who was Louis Rivera at the time. So just you know, it's just something to notice. You know, I think you know when you are a journalist, you have to have your sources right. So. You know, I love talking about bias and things like that, and I'm not saying that's the case here, but I mean. Those were the headlines they were. I mean, it's black and white. So what did David Latt say about Wendy's involvement? And he has since admitted that he has changed his tune um, and that he, you know, he found, finds some things suspicious. But I mean, the narrative is out there. We're talking about the narrative that was pushed out between these three men, these three, you know, um, avenues of, of media. And so let's look at David um, Latt. And he says, you know, this is like right after the 2020 and everything came out. And this is what he had to say about it. He said, um, I previously expressed my, in my pages my belief that Wendy um, Adelson, the ex-wife of Slane's Florida State professor, law professor, Dan McHale, did not have advanced knowledge or any role in planning Dan's murder. I cited a few facts in support of this view. First, Wendy spoke with law enforcement for eight hours. It wasn't eight hours. It was five. Even Wendy mended that on the stand. So he's already giving her um, three extra hours. Then he writes, um, which I don't know why, on, on that day, Dan was shot without a lawyer. Dan was shot without a lawyer, without a lawyer herself, even though she as a lawyer and law professor knows the right to counsel. Um, again, reverse psychology. Uh, second, after and to get information um, on the what's going on if they caught anyone. Second, uh, after the lengthy interrogation, the police did not view Wendy as a suspect and to this date has not charged her with anything. Well, they're not going to say if they viewed her as a suspect. And even if they did, maybe they're not telling the truth because they're still investigating. Third, later she wrote and podcasted about Danny's death. And I previously argued if Wendy knew about or was involved in Dan's murder or even wrote about it for a class and spoke about it on a podcast, she would be, have to be stupid, insane or both. And even though um, one can say many critical things about Wendy, as one can say many about any human being, um, I think she conducted herself perfectly during, I didn't think, she, I don't think she conducted herself perfectly during her divorce with Dan, but I don't think she's stupid or insane. Okay. Yeah, those are valid, you know, points. Um, but, you know. And he also writes um, about her interview and about the TV and her recounting the joke about the TV joke, cheaper to get you this TV. He writes chilling. Um, and I will add that if Charlie ordered the hit on Danny and Wendy knew about it in advance and supported it, she definitely would not have mentioned this terrible joke to the police. She would have kept her mouth shut and protected her brother. See, but that's your bias. You know, because you're thinking, what would you do? You know, because I'm a lawyer, you're, you know, a lawyer, you know, so you're, 
you're going to act like I'm going to act, you know, but not thinking about this is a planned thing, right? She's, she's smart. She plays, you know, she's trying to get away with this, right? So I don't know. And then it says, if Wendy knew in advance or was involved in planning Ginsburg, I don't think she would have agreed to sit for a multi-hour interview. And I don't think she would have reacted the way. So he's he's commenting on her behavior, saying her behavior kind of exonerates her, right? Which is weird because that's kind of the opposite of, you know, Stephen Epstein didn't even want to look or comment or write as a storyteller about the behavior because he was a, came out as a lawyer's view. So you just it's interesting. Um, and it says she she would have to be an actress on the level of Meryl Streep and view herself as the actress level of Meryl Streep to consent to such an interview and perform credibly. Well, Donna's email said you're a great actress, right? So of course she considers herself a great actress and her mom keeps reinforced, has reinforced that. We have an email stating that. So, and again, you know, if you, so he, he bought that, he bought, he thought she was very convincing in her um, interrogation, like the other, like Matt Shear said, it was like very genuine to him. And he wrote, I very, very much am open to the possibility of someone connected to Wendy and Dan because they thought it would help Wendy and to protect her from criminal liability, it kept it a secret from her and possibly, um, can't read that, raised in this interview. So that's basically it. It's just a short little presentation. We'll, we can go through the comments, but again, first podcast, viewed Wendy's interrogation as credible. And then in the follow-up, like really, you know, her driving up to the police interview, um, all that, you know, nothing. And right now that's how it stands. Um, and very eager and eager to talk about almost getting to interview her. Then we see the same exact thing with the first book to be written while this is all still unfolding with Stephen Epstein, who doesn't think she's involved. And, you know, we didn't get into the facts of why he gave but then also um, said that he watched the interview five times with Craig Isom. And he still doesn't think that Wendy, so that, that was just weird. That stuck out to me. And then, you know, he also likes to talk about how he almost got to, as like a soundbite, that he almost got to talk to Wendy. So you see there's patterns. And then, you know, David Latt, who was the first one. Um, and obviously I'm over my dead body and, you know, David Lass reporting, I was grateful for it and a great consumer of it. And just the, the pattern also, too, um, you know, where he went out and said that because of Wendy's behavior, that it's, it's very unlikely that he did, you know, that she did and was saying, like, don't talk, you know, kept promoting her lawyer's words about it. if you talk about it, about it on her online, they'll, you know, will sue you. So it just, you know, those are just that's those are the storytellers thus far through journalism, blogging, through a podcast medium, and then through the first book. And they all held this view that Wendy was being genuine. And, you know, I think they all were like e eager to get their little you know, hands, you know, to talk to her. And it's just, I don't know. It's a pattern. I see it. I'm not saying anybody's wrong. So anyway, let's go ahead and let's read some of these comments. See what you think about that, my theory. These three guys, these three people pumping out narratives first, all kind of have similar vibes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. hundred percent with Chris Evans. Yes. Chris Evans is estranged, but we lost an honor to both families. Yeah. Why, why would you take an honor away? And so one kid now doesn't have a middle name if, you know, those everything is on those papers is still correct. And one does. And I think the other one's the name's like Jonah or something. She, yeah, Katie says, yeah, she went, Katie kool says, wait, she went right straight to sobbing. No shock, immediate sobbing. Estranged, but the odd bouts of sobbing as well. Yeah. And then, you know, it's even if you look at her behavior in trials, you know, there was that woman, um, Judy probably knows the name, Carol Liebman. Yeah. Um, where, you know, this is what her jam is. She does criminal psychiatry and she can, she reads behavior and she looks and she watches people and she's, you know, very experienced and has a profile. And she was like, Amber Heard, you know, this woman is completely <laughs> not credible. The jury will hate her. But on the other hand, people view, these people viewed their, their interrogation thought, yeah, 
that is genuine. No way that's not genuine, that chair sauce. Um, Kitty Kalady says, another thing I noticed watching it again is when she sniffs, I think it's a tell. She sniffs when she's switching gears or avoiding a question. Interesting. Go back and watch for that. Katie Cool Lady says, it's like when Scott Peterson just let his tears roll down his face without wiping them away, making sure everyone see how sad they are. I kept wanting her just to grab a, da a damn Kleenex. Yeah, she had, she went through all the Kleenex, remember? She's like, oh, I'm done. Get, can we get more tissues? Estrange says, I think men can be more easily fooled than women in assistance. Well, it's just, we have that, we have that experience. We go, we've gone behind the scenes, you know, girls you know playing with groups of girls normally on the playground um so you're just all your and you know how you feel and, and it, you know and then when you get older you know women have and it's, you know it's true you have this like sexual capital you know capitalism where you can it is something that can't be it's it's in nature that it's something you have that somebody wants and males want and it's a lifetime of navigating that and so these men are analyzing her behavior. I don't know. It's just a lot of it's just it's tells and intuition and life experience. And um, again, women's intuition is a real thing. It's recognized. It's, um, it's researched. Me too. Angela says without physical strength, women develop methods to get what they want. Men can't see it because they have never had to use their feminine wiles to get what they want. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Hey, Judy. Uh, Judy says, yeah, right. When has been able to control her side of the story? Yeah, I thought that was really funny, too. Or it's like, she hasn't been able to control her narrative. I wonder how she thinks she'll control it now. I think she's probably got her book or her narrative, like, up in Laura's safe right now, maybe. She's already got it all planned out. Responding to what Matt said, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe Matt wants has not been keeping up with the case since the podcast. I mean, yeah, I mean that's quite possible, and um, yeah, that's very true. But it was like his most prominent, you know, was wildly successful. I would think he would, especially after getting into the details. You know how we all are; can't look away, type of thing. Judy Kulay says, hi, Judy. They're saying hi back. Epstein sure changed his tune once he got, yeah, he did. He did course correct. Um, pretty good. Still have my issues, um, but, you know, he did do a lot better. Thanks. No, yeah, thanks, Judy. Um, Katie Kulay, I did not take his list objective personally. Yep. What's up? Brown and beauty. She's late, but she's here. I like your sunglasses and your lipstick and your headscarf. I like it all. I like the whole look. Jesus. Hi. Interesting. I've not listened to David Latt's podcast. Yeah. yeah. I haven't, I didn't listen to it. I just saw that little note about how one of the things he goes into is his correspondence with Wendy, which is kind of like just proving how they're like, Oh, it's salacious. Talk to Wendy. Um, it's a sound bite strange one um subjectively i won't be buying that objective book hello well estranged fancy do you talk about what the other brother said no i didn't um but that you know that was another great you know again i'm pointing this just this instance out but gosh that i'm so grateful that um i was shocked because as i mentioned previously i went in on you know Catherine's bond hearing and sat in. And so I heard all the evidence, you know, um, like a little mini case laid out. And I, you know, I'm not a lawyer or ever, but I sat there in there just like compelled. And that was before any 2020s or datelines. So when I heard that this podcast was coming out, I was like, oh my God, they're making a podcast about that. That one and only like true crime case that I went and did that and have been watching and, you know, I've been reading David Latt and everything. Um, and I'm, it's no other cases I'm really like that with, but whatever reason it just was. And I remember thinking, oh, that, yeah, that's so awesome. I cannot wait. And then I remember when Rob's interview came out, I was blown away, blown away. I never thought, you know, that he, not only would he go on the podcast, Rob, but then he would like talk about how he's estranged and just like be so, um, 
come across as so genuine and so different. And I just, I found that that to be extremely interesting. I was so, that was such a good part of the podcast. I felt like David Lack got spooked by threats of lawsuits. Yeah, there's always that lurking in the background. I think so. He pretty much said so in the end of the article about Laurel threatening to sue people. Yep. My heart goes out to David Lack. He nearly died of COVID. Yeah, he was on an incubator. Remember that? Like one of the first people to get COVID, too. Yep, she must be stupid or insane. Yeah, you guys seem to be okay now. They're all trying to gaslight us, but we aren't having it. Because we get up in the details. They have never had a people on their case, pun intended, like the fans of the Dan Markell case. We're cult-like. We just need to be kind to each other. For all striving. In the words of John Singer, we all want the Adelsons arrested, right? On Surviving the Survivor. That, which was a great episode. But on that episode, no, none of them, when they're all talking about Katie's proffer and whatnot, none of them talked about the possibility of what and if Garcia, Sigfredo Garcia jumping into the equation and how that might give more weight to Katie's words or they could corroborate each other. Um, but, you know, everyone seems kind of not um, enthused about what Garcia could provide in terms of receipts. But who knows? Um, yes, that's true. It's strange. Uh, it was funny, Judy says. I was editing a video for YouTube and wanted a photo or a gift of a stressed out Asian lawyer and a photo of David Lash showed up as an option. That's funny. You're getting better at your graphics, Judy. I mean, I am too. Each time you do these things, that's why it's like practice. I can see a difference from the first videos I did of this case to the progression to now. And it's, you know, even true lifestyles, mentor lawyer, um, the skill set. LOL. LOL. Lots of LOLs. It was a pro Judy says, it was a process of realizing that, way that Wendy was very likely involved in her, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And again, wouldn't it be, um, I mean, this case is so crazy. There is like a percentage of chance because I can't rule anything out that Katie comes out and says it was me and Charlie. And Charlie said, whatever we do, we can't, you know, my, we can't let my sister know we're doing this. You know, it's, you never know. This case is wild. And maybe Wendy is, I don't think so, but Katie, a cool lady says they got to stop thinking like a lawyer and start thinking like a sociopath. Yes. Yeah, and Katie Cool Lady is um, a nurse. Um, you're like a psychiatric nurse, right? So you really have to get in their head. And yes, you want to tell a story as a lawyer. Um, but, you know, Judy's a really good example of this. Judy's the one who can break this wall. And yes, she gets probably criticism from other lawyers that are probably jelly, jealous of her. But when she does like her impersonation, you know, that's real creative creativity. Um, and I appreciate it. And I would, I would consider that an asset for my lawyer to have something like that. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a different way of, you know, I like it. It's interesting. Everyone wants someone who's interesting and in that in anything you do, even, even if you look at a doctor, you want your doctor to be creative. You want your doctor to think outside. It's an art, not a science medicine, you know? Um, so strange and personally knowing them let had to go had, had to go through that process yep uh judy says to katie cooley i agree you have to stop assuming people are normal and, and empathy like yourself yeah i think you know going back to the the david lat piece you know he's thinking this is a girl that this is a girl that sat could have sat beside me in like law school or you know you know she's she's like me she's educated she's smart so like a smart person like me wouldn't have sat without a lawyer and that you're not thinking like someone who's trying to, you know, even Wendy said she's trying to cheat the system and marry a husband. She like passionate love for this is someone who's constantly trying to, um, you know, she dropped the name and checked that she's restoring to her former, former name of her um, kids on that form that I've done in previous videos. Normal. See, David Latt wouldn't do that. Right. So he can't be attributing all of Wendy's behavior to kind of like, in terms of like get his head around her and the reverse psychology and the tricks and things. Maybe that's not what he would do, but I, you know, I get what he's laying out, but he's also a prosecutor as well. So, um, 
there's no he knows that thing there's things that he hasn't seen um anyway it's complicated yes her own mother and she's seen it before wendy's acting yeah so she does think she's meryl streep um yeah i think that she he didn't want to risk pissing off any of his sources and he knew laura was reading everything yeah Katie Cooley says to Judy, so true. None of these family members have empathy. I mean, who thinks murdering a father is the best option for their kids? Katie Cooley says, Laura sounds like a drama queen bantering around on IG with um, or YouTube with fancy fiction. Seriously. Yeah. If it is him. So that's the whole thing. It's like, why should I take someone seriously? I don't even know if it's, it's them. Yeah. YouTube. Uh, Liz, no offense to my gender or anyone else's, but all male producers, lawyers who first thought Wendy was innocent. She knows how to dupe and manipulate men, but look how rattled she gets by Georgia. Strange says, yes, Liz. Brown and Beachy says, I'm convinced that only a few people on earth can see through manipulation. Katie Cool Lady says, did anyone else catch how Wendy was flirting with um, Ducoast on the stand? Yeah, and I also noticed she did the same with um, Sam Zagane. Um and during the first trial, which is like, I think he's handsome when, you know, he did well in his classes, you know, it's that kind of, it's just, it, yep. Yes, Kitty Goldie, says Judy. Yeah, wait till Wendy faces Sarah Dugan, Angela says. Oh, I cannot wait. Sarah Catherine will eat up Wendy for lunch. Yeah, and if you, um, if you haven't already, go watch her. Sarah Dugan crossed this murderer guy, convicted murderer named Henry Sugera. It was another big trial in Tallahassee. And I think that's kind of what she had her like her it moment when she was crossing him. She got him angry and got him to break character. And then Judge Hankinson was sort of yelling at the Henry Sugera. It just was a good courtroom drama moment that Sarah Catherine Dugan had. And when I knew about that before she crossed Katie, I was like, oh, this is not going to be good because you got someone who's going to. Go for it. Um, oh, I'd love to see that. If Lambert, yeah, Amber Heard had a law degree. People see it. Yep. Yep. Dr. Carol, I love when Judy does this whenever I'm struggling. She's got a sixth sense for getting those deeds to me. Um, yes, Angela Strange, bring on the Dugan Kappelman dream team, our heroes. When I first saw them and I saw Sarah Dugan, I was like, and even how she talks in the case, man, I'm like, she's a carbon copy of um, Georgia. Can we get some variation? Can we get like a guy, like a male who's like got super high T testosterone that's going to like totally be super aggressive? Because um, there's value in both. Sarah Dugan did just fine. Just fine indeed. She, yeah, she's a pit bull that doesn't let go. True. Women's intuition. Women are trained to be nice, so evil women have to be more manipulative and subtle. Uh, contract Charlie versus Wendy. Yeah, I mean, too. Um, yeah, I mean, also, you know, we just, it's like, you know, you have like this power to do things, you know, just like a, a man can like pick a woman and just like snap her neck if they wanted to with physical strength. Women can do that kind of too emotionally. And, you know, if you've got wits and if you're pretty, and you know, you know, somebody likes you. I mean, you could string people along, you know, on and a man could too, but we just see it from the angle of how it's being done from the source. And once you've seen that and you recognize things, it's hard to like hear a man explain to you otherwise. You know what I mean? Like Wendy, you know, wouldn't give up the greatest achievement in her life, which was to giving a commencement speech to a bunch of freshmen. Um you know, for, you know, it, it, you know, that that's not, you know, she was valedictorian. She, you know, did a lot of other things. And then she moved to Miami and was a speaker at all these conferences. And we've seen her on the stage doing, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, I was just in South Beach last week, says Brown and Beachy, and met several attorneys. I was surprised that they had not heard of this case, or maybe they didn't want to talk about it. Interesting. Got some on-the-ground intel from Brown and Beachy. Katie Cool Lady, wonder if Wendy will be called in Charlie's trial. 
yeah, she files something. Ah, oh, some lawyer told me about that. I can't remember. I'll totally botch it. But like, they were like, the thing to watch for is when Wendy and and um, Charlie they they get in an adversarial role and file something. So I, I don't know. That's surprising, says Katie Pooley. So be short for South Beach. Brown and Beachy. I wonder if any local media hasn't been covering this case in depth due to the fear of retribution and more lawsuits. I think it was Miami New Times just did the thing with Ruth, right? So that was great. Yes. So. I dream about, Angel says, I dream about Lacoste testifying against Wendy in her trial. I don't think we've heard everything yet. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be tough on um, Lacoste, again, which is why I was so, maybe a part of why I was so protective of um him when I like heard about all the things, you know, just sort of the snarkiness and um, the way that he, you know, Stephen Epstein characterized Jeff Lacoste as like this lovesick guy who, you know, and I, I've done videos trying to show where I think Steve Epstein was way off in some of his um, characterizations of Jeff Lacoste because they're going to be really rough on him. So, you know, he'll be fine, I think, you know, definitely you've seen him as a great witness, but, you know, we have, we've seen him. We've seen him being, you know, crossed by people that were like the middleman or the hitman. We have not seen them being, you know, crossed by the Adelson's people, um, you know, and really laying on thick that he was this obsessed, jealous guy and all this stuff. Um, so uh, that should be, I dream of, you know, I don't, I don't think I would want to see it, him getting crossed. Um, Judy says uh, to Katie Pooley, Wendy probably wouldn't be called. I don't think the state really needs her and would give her limited immunity uh, anymore. And yeah. There we go. I just saw this comment on a Facebook page. I have a theory that came is going to reveal just how serious the plan was to frame Jeffrey Lacoste. It was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, because she had that dinner, right, in March. So if they're already thinking about doing this, and, and Jeff Lacoste said that Wendy seemed like really excited about Catherine Magbanoa, you know, and about Charlie's girlfriend, um, and about how, you know, he knew that Charlie had given Wendy kind of a complex with all of his comments about, you know, no one wants to take, date a single mom in her 30s, and then showing up at this, and it's a single mom in her 30s. <laughs> Um, and Wendy being, you know, kind of amped about Katie uh, meeting this girl. So, um, you know, if they were in cahoots, they could have all just been kind of sitting there thinking, uh, you know, I don't know. They all knew each other, right? They had dinner. Yeah, that would be amazing if Garcia corroborated Katie and, and told all about what he knew, Wendy, and how Wendy was his homie. Yeah. Or if they've met, I totally have always thought that Sigfredo can directly invocate uh, Wendy, just an intuition, you know, because of that homie comment, it's because he seemed to recognize her. And Lewis said, you know, he seemed, he thought that they had met before because he would recognize her. That's that lady, you know, that's Wendy. So, but then there was this jailhouse confession um, and it's on Mentor Lawyers channel, I believe, um, where one of the guys, you know, was talking to, uh, I think, Isom. He was with Sigfredo and got drunk on toilet wine, that one. It was about how, like, they, there was talk of the mother-in-law in there, you know, um, about how she was um, evil. But I definitely think it was a family affair. I don't think Sigfredo met Donna. I think he met Wendy. But also, that's kind of crazy if they opened it up. You know, I don't know. Gosh, I hope it is fruitful and they don't seal it and we have to wait a million months, but we might. Brown and Beachy says, they asked the brother if he thought he knew what had happened when he heard the news. The brother said, unfortunately, yes. Wow, he knows the pathology of his family. Yeah. He's, and then I think he said on top of that, he was hoping it wasn't the worst case scenario, which I think is what Wendy knew about it and killed her um, ex-husband. Miranda B. Didn't think... Rob essentially said the whole family was involved in the podcast. He was asked, we knew it happened. And he said, yes, I just hope it wasn't. Yeah. So I didn't should have read that comment. Angela, a voice for the victims to Katie. Oh, wow. Didn't think Katie revealing the plot to frame Lacoste. I'm tripping. Yeah. 
Katie Cool Lady says, Charlie is such a big mouth. He likely told Kay and everything. I know, right? Especially since he turned, we know from the second in um, trials that when Ryan Patrick had testified, he testified that Charlie made the comment to him, you can get away with murder. You just can't, you just don't, you can't talk about it if you don't talk about it. So, you know, well, that's someone who can't like resist just saying something tangentially to a friend. But think about what he, what he would want to say to someone, you know, he was planning this with. Um, and even if you, um, you know, they spent the night together, but I haven't, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of like, that's a lot of time to be spending and to be so in deep with something so serious with somebody you're like interlocked. And I think there's a great possibility he ran his mouth. Um, Brown and Beachy, your graphics are so hilarious. I will never look at the staple saying thank you. <laughs> I'm having fun with it. What can I say? Agreed. Kitty Coolity says they had months, if not years, to plan the strategy to protect and shield Wendy and come up with a plan to appear innocent. Yep. Geek Squad. I pray Angela says, I pray that Kitty has receipts for what Charlie told her. Yeah, that's a big question. Brown and Beachy, exactly. We have to think that like they do. This is why I do not think Kitty will ever tell the truth, even less jail time. Kitty wants both a continued paycheck as well as a lesser sentence. Yeah, she definitely, I mean, she rolled the dice twice with her life. That's crazy to me. I would never have the balls to do that. Good point, Brown and Beachy, says Katie Cool Lady. Katie Cool Lady says, if Katie has any knowledge to, to anything that they have presented as, yet as evidence to corroborate it, isn't that as good as a receipt, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know, like in terms of, you know, a legal standpoint, what has more weight, but Brown and Beachy says, a keen woman is manipulative woman's nightmare. I know. That's how, you know, I imagine what Wendy thinks of me and the other women, you know, and Judy and uh, True Lifestyles. They are very aware of who they can potentially dupe and who is, uh, isn't talking any shit, taking shit off them. Yeah, I mean, I, even, you know, even being like a cheerleader and in the South and um, even being, you know, in the South and that culture, and I've lived in New York, too, um, for many years. So it's just like the both of them where one will say exactly what they're thinking to your face and be very direct, sort of like the Dan Markell, um, which is what I prefer, you know, uh, even if it's not when you hear. And then there's like a culture where you can't say anything mean, you know, where it's kind of like they'll say something like, oh, I like that dress. You know, turn around and go, that dress looks awful on her. You know, that's kind of the, like that, that passive aggressive um, Southern culture. And I grew up in that. And so you're constantly, you know, looking to decipher if someone was being real with you um, growing up. And then you so you, you almost have to like have like a decoder ring for that, you know, when people are talking out of the side of their mouths um, or if they were really sincere. And then to, to go to New York and sort of get that that opposite of that, um, you know, some there's there's a skill of figuring out of reading people and women in particular know their own kind better. Contrast, yeah, contrast, yep. Judy says um, to Katie Cool Lady, uh, it all depends on how credible each point is. Yeah, they all have a different weight, like scales. Brown and Beachy says to Judy, it's very likely that uh, Miami News isn't following the story. Yes, yeah, someone else said that if you really, and I read a comment somewhere where someone, and I don't, you know, I tend to believe it, but can't confirm it's true just from the way it was written. Um, but it was just a comment saying that Wendy was overly nice to people that weren't aware of the murder or the situation, but she came off as like really being overly nice. And that in itself, you know, is off putting to people and people think it's weird. But it's just fascinating to think that she, she's walking around kind of seeing people look at her, you know, in the um, grocery store and not knowing if they're identifying her, if, if who she is or if they're aware of the media. Um, Drew says to Brown and Beachy, that would be too bad. That's why it's great. We now have the internet and YouTube for possible news sources. Yep. Angela to Katie, cool lady. Yes. If Katie get, give, if what Katie gives can be corroborated, that is good as receipts. Katie cool lady says, just hoping the state has lots of evidence against the, um, the Adelsons we have not seen yet. Like Katie might also have info about. Yep. Judy. Uh, Lacoste presented well, doesn't seem too flappable. Yep. Um, 
Brown and Beach, he says to Katie Palady, uh, yes, South Beach is South Beach. My favorite restaurant is SoFi South of Fish. And I was hoping one of the A's came in during my daily bite, but they are deeply hiding. Yeah, maybe South of Fifth, not Fish, LOL. Angela to Judy, I agree. Lacoste is solid now. So many years removed from the emotional turmoil. Katie Cool Lady says, not sure where there's a smile came from, Brown and Beachy. I, I dream you end up in a restaurant with the, Adel, the Adelsons while they're under surveillance. I would be looking around for undercover cop. Yes, or you yourself can keep your ears open and maybe you'll catch something from a witness. Support for Jeff Lacoste, yeah. It's only going to get harder from, you know, from here. He'll be fine, but it's just there's people with more incentive to totally undo his character for no reason. We've seen good people being torn down by defense lawyers. That's their job, but it's going to be harder because um, the people have more of a incentive so, to get you. Brown and Beachy says to Katie Cool Lady, um, me too. Katie Cool Lady says, agreed on Jeff Lacasa. I hope he's healed from this freaky family. Anyone else think Wendy kept him around strictly for framing benefit? Yeah, I wonder if he even knows, you know, has a good, strong feeling on that. I bet he doesn't. It's like, eh. But the way that whole breakup went down, but like needing a break, going away for a couple weeks to Miami, and then being all super lovey-dovey, and that I miss you stuff, and then you come back, and you need another week, and then you need to go on a walk with your friend to talk about it. I mean, they were only dating nine months, and then, like, getting – freaked out um and i noticed that when i was going back pulling the b-roll from judy's conversation with steve epstein he says that Dan, you know because of the jealousy around um the other daniel that he reached out in addition to jane i'm forgetting his name daniel Sachs. um he said that epstein said that daniel Sachs was the person that wendy dated after dan markel but that's not true there was someone else that wendy admitted to and during the first trial when Tara, Tara Kawas asked how soon Wendy had a boyfriend, and she said within a month. And that guy's name was Miguel Edmondson, which is referenced, I think, in the deposition, if I believe so, but it's somewhere in court documents, not in the trial. So she, you know, had a, a month after. So it wasn't wasn't the next boyfriend, as Steve Epstein says. But you know, I don't. Yeah, I think Jeff was jealous, but then he was also saying he was repeatedly giving her out, like if this is not for you. Don't you know? Don't act like, you know, I, I'm not supposed to be getting certain cars because I'm, you know, and that you're telling me that the kids are going to start calling me dad. And at the same time, you know, be doing this. It's just very confusing. Um, she was playing around with his emotions while screwing around on them, wanting him to move in with her. And yeah, emotional, using the kids as emotional pawns. Yeah, that's right, Judy. Good memory of that. Um. Angela, leisurely engaging in sex is a part of the Wendy Charlie playbook to control their prey. So gross. Katie Cooley says, yes, yeah, someone said he was likely babysitting for her while she went on dates with other guys. Katie Cooley, Wendy is the worst of them all. Brown and Beachy, yes, just like um, Brand from the Closer TV show, her character was from the South. And when she said, thank you. It didn't mean thank you. It meant I'm going to get your ass. Yeah. And also like bless your heart. You know what I mean? So I grew up around that and around even like my friends and even seeing their mothers do it to their other friends, like in the kitchen and just like, like, wow, like noticing like that is the behavior. It's really, it gets you, you're on edge and you learn from it, you know? Um, he actually said that himself. Yeah. Bless your heart. Yeah. So I just, people are um, writing these before me. Uh, Angela, yes, it's used as a passive, like a middle finger. Yep. Sure enough. Ha uh, stomach cramp laugh. Yep. I'm in the South, grew up in Georgia. Yep. Yep. I spent some time in Alabama. Put it that way. Um, JL uh, was for framing from the beginning. First, she would never date anyone who lives in Tally. Second, this was the entire process of the yo-yo narc style. She said, yeah, I agree with that process of the narc style. But he, um, you know, he could have moved. You know, I think he had just he had just moved to Tallahassee from Arizona. So it's not like he was, like, born and bred in Tallahassee. 
But um, I think, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe, you know, who may know? Katie may know. And she may be, have just told everybody. And now I just need to release the tapes. They need to release the tape. Release the Katie McBanawa tapes. Hashtag release the tapes. Hashtag Katie McBanawa. We should get that trending and tag the um, state's attorney's office. Um, I heard bless your heart in a grocery store in Jackson, Mississippi, and I knew it couldn't be good. Yeah, it's, that's actually very bad. It's a war cry. It's a war chant right there. Agree. Okay. We've gone an hour and 10 minutes. I'm going to wrap it up um, unless anyone wants to do any last minute Q&A. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to go over, you know, again, the prominent, the three prominent voices and you know again i will say you know it's not like they did great thing i mean some of it it's not like an all bad thing and enjoyed a lot of what was put out for sure um but it's just something i noticed patterns so okay that's why donna didn't give jay all the time of day he was no more than a short-term problem yeah i mean that's where my mind went when especially when he was talking about how they would always stay kind of separate and be cold to him. Yeah, Donna knew he didn't make a ton of money as a social science professor, so she didn't care about getting to know him. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could say the same for like, you know, the June, you know, how Donna was kind of whatever with June and how gung-ho she was with Dave, you know, hitting the lottery. Right, Judy. Waiting for the proper results to get me aging like those apid aging pictures of Catherine and Wendy Fancy. But yeah, exactly. We're dying here. We're dying here. Give us some relief. Hey, question for the group. What do you take of KM still being in Leon County Jail? Yes. That's very interesting. Because that means, that could mean she's doing a lot of talking or she's hanging around to do something else. But, um... If you even look at, you know, Louis Rivera gave a lot of proffers before he did a, a tape proffer, you know? Um, and so they can give a couple of proffers before they come and do like a recorded one. So I don't know. That's a good question. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go off this, you know, you know, please, um, you know, watch this later if you didn't catch it now. Everyone have a great rest of your Sunday and thanks for listening. Wait, hold on, we'll get Judy. Maybe she's going to hang out with Rashbaum and depose her at the time the next hearing, December 6th. Just a guess. Yeah, maybe. I wonder if part of her deal is that she gets to remain in there until Charlie's trial. Oh, you mean gets to hang out in Leon County Jail as opposed to Lowell and just kind of extends her stay in a nicer um, jail, not a prison where she's um, comfortable. And that's why she's maybe smiling because she didn't like Lowell. <laughs> All right. Have a good, have a good evening, everybody. Bye.